Hello everyone, we're back again with another critique video. Today on the channel we have Mike the Vegan. So, this is a video that was posted two days ago, as of today, entitled Top 5 Carnivore Myths Debunked. I've never critiqued Mike, but today is going to be the day. So, I've noticed though, before we even get into this, that instead of actually having any quality content to promulgate and upload to YouTube, all he does is spend his time disparaging and denigrating the carnivore diet. It's just ridiculous. Get a life, okay? Seriously. The pallid, haggard Mike the Vegan has more things to say therefore on the carnivore diet. So let's look at this. It's a 25 minute video, 24 minutes and 18 second video. We'll see if he has anything of utility to say here that's utilitarian and we'll see if we can get through all of it. It's Mike here, and today, the top five carnivore myths debunked. These are at least five that I hear a lot. If you have different ones, let me know down below. We're talking about things like, does meat contain all the nutrients that you need? Yes, it does. Absolutely, unequivocally, unambiguously so, yes. You know, is oxalate dumping actually real? Yes, it is. We have evidence of that. People dump oxalates through their eyes in some cases. A lot of times it's through their toes. We see it. Now, me personally, to be just completely transparent, I've never seen it in person, but I don't really talk to a lot of carnivores in person because it's still a nascent diet, so to speak. The adoption of such a diet is nascent. And also, it seems to be the case that oxalate dumping occurs with older individuals that have had time to accrue oxalates in their tissues issues for longer than someone like I have, which may be why I never went through that. The people I talk to in person are my age. I'm 20 years old, Mike. The dismissal of the whole vitamin C scurvy concern. It's not a concern, Mike. Are you kidding me? Holy shit. Let's talk about vitamin C. Fun fact, I've never talked about vitamin C on my channel because it's never actually become salient or relevant in these videos. Honestly, in a backwards way, I hope he starts talking about it. Really hope so. Over that and a ton more, way too much. But these are myths that lure people into the carnivore diet and it's- Okay, how about we talk about the myths that beguile and lull people into the vegan diet, a deadly diet, destitute and bereft of essential nutrition for individuals, and also teeming and replete with plenty of metabolism destroying compounds, Mike. How about we talk about that? You wanna talk about desperate evasion and prevarications? Talk about people like you within the vegan space, Mike. Pallet haggard Mike ethos of the diet, which I think is misinformation. We're gonna look at research. Well, I don't give a shit what you think it is. That's an opinion. And it's also predicated upon fallacious ideology and theology and a backwards view of life and what it entails. He backs that, but again, a lot of the carnivore diet argument is that like, oh, there isn't science against it. Well, because there is no freaking science on it, essentially, so. Yeah, there's no science on any f diet, Mike. When are you going to get your silly little head around that fact? Human nutrition science is bread and circuses. Why is it bread and circuses? Because it's theology. Why is it theology and not science? Because science requires experimentation. There are no experiments conducted in human nutrition science and there never will be. Because in order to perform experiments on human beings, you need to take two genetically identical twins, both phenotypically and genotypically identical, separate them at birth, put them into two metabolic ward lock-in rooms, observe them over their entire lives, attempting to infer lifelong health outcomes, 40 years for 40 year long health outcomes, etc., and control for every single f variable except the one that you are studying, Mike. Implausible for obvious reasons. Wouldn't get past an ethics committee, rightfully so. And also exorbitantly expensive. So f right off. There's no science to underpin the longevity effects of any diet diet, or any food, or even any activity that humans engage in. You infer conclusions as to what is indicated for human beings, dietarily and lifestyle-wise, by looking at other sciences, like hard sciences, biochemistry, regular chemistry sometimes, human physiology, and you make more judicious inferences from things like paleoanthropology, inferential paleoanthropology. Oh, also, another hard science, chemical anthropology. How about we talk about the isotope analyses conducted in 2019 and then further in 2021 that established what human beings are unequivocally designed to eat and what we unequivocally ate for millions upon millions of years, if you include proto-humans that preceded our current speciation, Mike. Anyway, I can go on and on, but let's not. Science that I can, but I'll also speak in their language, which is anecdotes by even looking at a bunch of cases on Reddit. But we do have some case reports as well, which is always good to look at. So let's just get right into it. Fifth number one, meat has all the nutrients that you need. Absolutely. It has all of the nutrients that you need to not only survive, but thrive. We see this. And again, you like to say that our language, just like what you just heard him say, is anecdotes. Well, the plural of anecdotes, if they become, I don't know, large enough, or at least the sample of anecdotes becomes large enough, that just becomes data. If an association is large enough, 
enough, it's pretty obvious what the inferences are there. For example, the association between, I don't know, statin taking populations and the presentation within those populations of ALS and invariably fatal condition. That's 11,500%. Pretty obvious what's going on there because that's the same strength of an association you see in populations that smoke and presentations within those populations of lung cancer. Looking to chronometer for that classic. Oh God, chronometer. Because let me tell you something, Mike. If you're going to start referring to the RDAs and the RDIs, what are those based upon? What diet are those based upon? A high sugar diet? Yes. Glucose and other types of sugar seem to interfere with the amount of nutrients that one requires in order to actually maintain a salubrious physiological environment, it seems, ostensibly. <sighs> Okay, these are based on normative levels of the population, which are also, once again, it's not just based upon standard American diet, it's based upon an unhealthy population, usually as a result of eating that contraindicated insalubrious diet. Pounds of steak a day that a lot of people follow on the carnivore diet. So basically, before we even get into this, I've already dispelled and, and we can therefore dispense with this nonsense. I don't even have to comment on any of this. Uh, yeah, the nutrition gaps be gapping. First up, we have vitamin B1, which is low AF. B5 misses it a bit, but for B1 deficiency symptoms, they include irritability, which you will see in the comments, poor memory, literally forgetting to eat plant. Berry berry. Yeah, there's dry and wet berry berry. Yes, it results in things like confabulation, psychiatrically speaking. Confabulation in the psychiatric definition does not mean to converse or talk. It means to compensate for a lack of memory by fabricating events that didn't actually occur. It has to do with its effects in the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex through the glycolytic pathway, the first enzyme within the three enzyme complex known as pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Yeah, uh -huh. I know exactly why this stuff occurs. I know exactly what thiamine deficiency results in, okay? Inability to convert pyruvate into acetyl-CoA in aerobic conditions, I'm putting that in quotes for reasons that would take too long to explain in this video, but anyway. Wild, but weight loss as well. But anyway, but what I'm saying is that actually doesn't happen because this is predicated upon a standard American diet and an unhealthy population. Blah, 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 blah. I already covered it. Anyway, next. There's a win. We have folate, which is abysmally low in terms of intake. And yeah, it is low as compared to the threshold that's based upon normative levels of the population that's based upon a poor diet. Okay. Kayla Peterson, carnivore dieter, appears to have gotten a folate deficiency, as she said on Twitter months ago. It's not a deficiency, because a deficiency means it's lower than what is actually required by the body. You're not getting enough. I saw her say this a while back. Yeah, December 27th, 2022, and I thought the exact same thing that I'm saying in this video right now, which is, you're not deficient. You feel fine. You feel the best that you've ever felt. You're not deficient. That's not how it works. We'll get into that when we start talking about vitamin C. I'm eagerly waiting. And looking to Reddit's r slash carnivore, we can just see a ton of folate deficiency. No, they're saying low folate because they took a test and they believe that they're low on folate. They have no symptoms, I would suspect, okay? What does it take to get your head wrapped around this fact? level results for those people that actually bother checking it. Obviously, you want to have a healthy level of folate. Anyway, onto the vitamins. We have vitamin A, super low, vitamin C, D, E, K. I mean, do I need to go through the whole alphabet at this point? This is ridiculous. And we're going to go really deep into vitamin C. This is the most vapid, superficial, jejune nonsense that I've heard. Mike spouts the most superficial nonsense, the most vapid talking points. And people eat it up as evinced in the comments section on that later on, but just looking through r slash carnivore for deficiencies, was when I saw that I wasn't expecting, and that was vitamin B12. From the comments, it appears that the poster isn't the only one with this issue, and those commenters say, just take B12 supplements. <sighs> Next time people attack vegans for B12, I'm just- Okay, those comments are completely misinformed as well. Them up I get that they're trying to help, but sorry, wrong version of presentation matters more than levels. Sean Baker has presented with low total and free testosterone on multiple occasions, and he's six foot five, six foot six, and strictly muscle. He's not low in testosterone. His body probably produces less because of the fact that it doesn't need to produce as much, and it's more utilitarian, the amount that is produced. It's ridiculous, Mike. You actually made a video claiming that Sean Baker was low on testosterone. You're looking at a number on a test. Oh boy, you're gonna be eaten alive in life. You actually, in fact, you already are being eaten alive. All appeal to authority or appeal to systems and mechanisms that were put in place by authority figures. So in other words, it's indirect appeal to authority. It's childish and desperate. 
<laughs> we continue with the minerals with super low calcium, copper, magnesium, and manganese. And one Jasmine Foster did a 100 plus reference right up on just how much one might miss their targets for these nutrients and it's wild, like grass fed or not, you're likely to be about 80% short on your calcium intake. Mm -hmm. And then there's things you're getting way too much of, like you're getting too much saturated fat, too much- There's no such thing as too much saturated fat, Mike. I mean, there is such a thing as too much of anything, but try and overeat on saturated fat, as long as it's only associated with protein and nothing sweet or anything carbohydrate laden. Go ahead and try and do that, because you're not gonna fucking do it, Mike. There's no evidence that saturated fat is causal in any disease process, actually, let alone heart disease. Same thing with cholesterol, which is what you're about to talk about right fucking now. Cholesterol is not causal in heart disease. Any excess cholesterol that one can Consumes is simply recycled and or excreted by the body as is indicated at any given instance in time. One plus or minus one percent of atherosclerotic plaque consists of cholesterol, by the way. It's largely composed of scar tissue that can become calcified at later stages and rupture, then causing thrombi after becoming unstable. And that takes decades to occur and develop as well. So all these videos you make where these people adopt a carnivore diet and within months they have a stroke and you try and act like that was due to carnivore is completely evincing of your destitution of knowledge. Even the most basic bits of knowledge, Mike. Ridiculous. Get a grip. Trans fat and definitely too much cold. Trans fats, Mike? Really? There are some trans fats that occur in nature. The trans fats that are deleterious and contraindicated are the ones that are formed from the derangement of pre-existing non-trans fats through heat and pressure from industry. <laughs> Conjugated linoleic acid is a trans fat found in meat. It's not all trans fats, Mike. Give me a break. Seriously. And then finally in terms of- Yeah, cholesterol. If cholesterol is caused on heart disease, why does it not occur in veins if veins and blood vessels carry the same blood? The only time atherosclerosis occurs in veins is if the vein was introduced into a high pressure area of the vascular system, indicating that pressure is a cause of heart disease gradually, which is true because of the abrasions that occur to the junctions of the epithelial cells, lining the arteries and to a lesser extent the veins, but veins are low pressure areas of the vascular system. They take blood back to the heart. You can predict where atherosclerotic lesions are going to occur and the plaque buildup is going to occur via these mechanisms and via these processes. It's so obvious. I can go on and on about cholesterol as well. Cholesterol is regulated by by your genes and nothing else. It is totally devoid of omega-3 fatty acids. No, not totally devoid. False. See that number right there? See 0 0.2 grams? There are sufficient and adequate amounts. There's plenty of polyunsaturated fatty acids that are required for life within red meat and animal products. There is plenty in the forms of bioavailable ones like DHA and EPA, docosahexaenoic acid, and icosapentaenoic acid. There's plenty there. Do you know how I know that? Because I'm not f***ing dead. Mike, goodness me, you need very little. You require very little polyunsaturated fatty acids. Look at that. That is ridiculous. And the no, you're f***ing ridiculous, Mike. You're ridiculous. Shut down your channel, please. Do us all a favor. Mountain grass fed is still laughably low. And yeah, people can eat fish for it, but a lot of people are just focusing on ruminant meat on a car. As they should, because that is what our species has evolved to eat primarily. As indicated and inferred, causally actually, by stable nitrogen and carbon isotope analyses conducted in 2019 and further in 2021 on the collagen of the long bones of ancient human remains that established once again unequivocally that 80% of our fuel intake came from the flesh and associated fat of large ruminant animals and the other 20% came from large fiber tubers that, inferentially speaking, were consumed during times of starvation and therefore unsuccessful hunts. The only other bit of that 20% was made up of, perhaps, some tiny bits of fruit here and there during the ever-ephemeral, ever-transient fruit season. That fruit not being anywhere near the fruit that we see today that is a product of human hybridization and grafting of plants to make them bigger, starchier, juicier, sweeter. And then when you look outside of chemical anthropology, you can infer that that 20%, the other 20%, should not be eaten and was therefore, once again, inferentially speaking, not not eaten alacritously, let's say, and eagerly. We did not desire to eat that food because it's not food. Fiber is a contraindication in the human diet. We may be getting into that as well because he may talk about how fiber is some sort of nutrient, which it's fucking not. Diet. All right, now for myth number three, oxalate. Di oh, wait, was that a dispelling of a myth? I'm sorry. I was waiting for a dispelling of a myth here. I didn't see any of that. Okay. I thought I was being pretty scrupulous with my critique here, but maybe I missed something. <laughs> is real slash just the whole- Where's your evidence that it's not? Salate theory of disease or just health issues. Well, we do know that oxalic acid binds to minerals within the body to form oxalates, primarily magnesium, calcium, and zinc. And we know that those form raphides, which are smaller than your cell membranes, and will obliterate them upon impact. We also know that 80%, roughly, of kidney stones are composed of calcium oxalate crystals.
We also have evidence that suggests that gout is a condition characterized by uric acids binding to oxalate crystals, not uric acid itself, which makes sense considering uric acid is a powerful water-based antioxidant that is produced endogenously within the body. Uric acid is not the cause of gout. Gout is an inflammatory condition that most likely requires uric acid's assistance in ameliorating, which is why it's associated. But go on, Nick. No. Mike, sorry normal people it is the case that people with like severe kidney issues are gonna have more oxalate problems oh why is that why is that mike also what is a conducive auspicious approach to actually causing kidney issues among many others probably consuming oxalic acid no not probably definitely consuming oxalic acid for years and years and years decades and decades most often because kidney stones occur when you're older typically at a point where oxalate dumping has become a catch-all term for any problem that somebody is facing on a carnivore diet. That's, that's true. It is very often overly diagnosed, and it's not officially diagnosed usually at all. It's a pretty incipient phenomenon. It's new within the medical sphere, and there's not a lot of diagnostic criteria that you can use, except for, well, seeing someone actually exuding oxalates from their skin, putting them under a microscope and seeing if they're oxalates or anything like that. Fair enough. I see that in the space all the time. It's overly diagnosed to explain away symptoms. Those symptoms usually manifesting as a result of impetuously and cursorily adopting the diet. Overnight adopting the diet, which is not indicated. We lead them to quitting, but no, that's just purification. You're just dumping these plant-based toxic- Oh, okay, so you're saying that detoxification and purification are just ways to explain away symptoms that people have when adopting a diet. Okay, tell that to every other f***ing vegan, Mike. Tell that to other vegans within your space, you hypocrite oxalates out of your body. Here is a carnivore GP listing the dangers of oxalate dumping. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, rashes, fatigue, weakness, palpitations, joint pains, inflammation. Or Perhaps some of those more probable than others, considering we know that oxalates actually deposit within joints a lot. So joint pains and inflammation, sure. Yeah. Palpitations. Palpitations would usually be the result of electrolyte imbalances, which is the result of potentially a few other things. But we'll get into that when that becomes relevant later on, if it does. This autoimmune activation, any kind of autoimmune system and uh, problem, sorry, can seriously flare when you get oxalate dumped. Too broad, I think. But again, it's also because it's new. We don't really know too much about it. And carnivores blame it for even more. I mean, everything from autoimmune diseases in general, which is probably the main one that I hear, to autism. Yep, you heard that right. That's ridiculous. In my opinion, that's ridiculous. Yeah, it is a case that dietarily, there's a distinction there, dietarily, you are getting them from plants. But as this study found, cooked vegetable consumption was associated with 75% lower odds of rheumatoid arthritis. Not lower odds, lower incidence. Reduction in risk, no, not risk. There are no studies to inform upon the risk of any heart health outcome or disease processes that relates to any aspect of human nutrition over any given period of time, as I explained in the beginning. Same thing with the reduction of risk. Reduction is another cause and effect word. Get that off the screen. Get that out of the paper. Fix it in the highest category of consumption. Okay, what is this? Associated with 75% lower odds of rheumatoid arthritis, which is- That's an association, an evapid one at that. We also know that lectins seem to also cause rheumatoid arthritis because of its interactions with gut bacteria and the creation of zonulin and leaking out through the gap junctions of the interior cells of the intestinal tract. We know that as well. So there's an association to throw right back at you, but f right off with this. It means nothing. This actually doesn't really have anything to do with oxalates, actually an autoimmune disease, you know, and they're telling you to stop eating that to fight things like arthritis. Yeah, because that was an association. That doesn't show anything, Mike. And there are so many other details that were left out of that. You showed an association, but what was the demographic of people? What was the sample size? How long did the study go on for? Was the diet the exact same? Also, do they even know that what these people said they ate is what they ate? Because it has to be based on respondent data because ethics committees disallow scientists, rightfully so, from spying on you to see what you're eating and what you're not eating. Fucking hell. Theology. That's that's the definition of veganism. And instead, advise meat only when studies like this one show meat consumption linked to twice the arthritis risk. Not linked to. Linked to can be used to describe associations, but is very often not. And we know what language you use in a recidivist fashion on a quotidian basis. So let's go ahead and just assume judiciously that you mean a causal relationship. You're referring to one. False. Not linked to fucking anything, actually, within this sphere, because it's theology. And major credit to Dr. Sarah Ballantyne, who has a PhD in medical biophysics. Oh, therefore she is God. She is a goddess, and she is omniscient within this space. Cool. <sighs> 
If you need any evidence that PhDs are not always cerebral and sapient and sagacious and any other word you want to use to describe someone being competent, go ahead and check out my videos on Lane Norton, because I have a few, one of which is exclusively on Patreon. I did a couple videos on oxalates and a more modern one. Under normal circumstances, the body has mechanisms to maintain oxalate homeostasis. Yes, it does, because oxalates are not only the product of actually consuming foods that have oxalic acid within them. They're a metabolic byproduct as well from amino acid metabolism. There's two in particular that I'm thinking of. Let me go ahead and look at that right now, actually, because I can't remember at the top of my head. To put this into perspective, our body creates only about 10 to 30 milligrams of oxalates per day is a waste product from the breakdown of the amino acids glycine and hydroxyproline and by a molecule called glyoxalate. That's from my book, Contraindicated. Go ahead and buy that. But anyway, yes, our bodies are not completely clueless to what oxalates are and how to withstand them to a certain degree. The problem is consuming far more than that. It is arduous and an onerous task on the body to withstand that load evinced in the development and presentation of kidney stones. Regardless of how much oxalates we ingest. No, she isn't a- We don't ingest oxalates. We ingest oxalic acid, actually, which form oxalates within the body after binding to minerals. No, she isn't a vegan, if that helps, and she mentions that your body actually makes a ton of its own oxalates, and I- Yeah, just covered that, actually. Mike? And that means you can never purify, you can never fully dump those oxalates into- We never said that you can fully do that. It's excess that we're talking about. These people, wow. Hunter claims, yes, from this study, 60 to 80% of your blood oxalates are made by yourself endogenously, so you ain't dodging this. Okay, so even if that statistic is true, wouldn't you want to avoid the other 40% if you're sensible? Oh yeah, you're not sensible. None of you people are. You're dogmatists, you're propagandists, you're theologians, or well, theologues unsubscribe or please subscribe and help me get to 400k because i'm like on the brink please <laughs> it's asinine do you see that that is abysmal you used the word abysmal earlier that's abysmal right there you know what that says right there viewers new or old or loyal it means we still have work to do Part here she mentions that the amino acid glycine is one of the precursors for endogenously made- Oh, do you see that right there, vitamin C? Yeah, no, it's not typically supposed to be converted into oxalates. It's not supposed to. Dehydroascorbic acid, which is the oxidized form of vitamin C, when consumed in excess, is converted into oxalates. It's one of the reasons why you shouldn't have excess vitamin C within the body. But again, he's gonna talk about vitamin C, I suspect. He said it in the beginning. And we'll get into the granular nitty gritty details when he starts talking about that. That. That's just your teaser. Phthalates, it is the case that vitamin C is also one. I know carnivores are gonna be like, huh, yeah, it's all from the vitamin C. Well, hey, let's- No, you don't know that people are gonna say that, you arrogant <laughs> because that's not true. In terms of your carnivore diet, meat appears to be the main source of glycine in a normal diet. So when you're eating two pounds of that- Congratulations. It creates 10 to 30 milligrams a day from things like that. It's made and designed to withstand that much. It doesn't mean that glycine is bad or contraindicated. You're gonna be getting about 16 grams of glycine on a two pound meat a day diet, yet just probably in the- So Mike, does glycine damage our tissues? Of milligrams at best of diet. You, you realize that many amino acids are incorporated into bodily tissues also. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Or eat vitamin C from normal natural sources. So which one is your liver gonna make more oxalates out of in this context? Well, to further- Am I the only one getting bothered by how he's pronouncing oxalates? Oxalate, hmm. Yes, I wish we had some good human studies, but from- There are no good human studies. Cover that in the beginning. Rat study, where they fed the mice glycine as well. Oh, okay, rats. So what diet did mice and rats evolve to eat and consume? Was it a carnivore diet, Mike? Well, if not, then get the f out of here with this as some collagen proteins that have glycine in them. Also, they found unexpectedly high amounts of endogenously formed oxalate in their poop, as well as 90%- Well, they were fed what? Was this them administering an exorbitant level of it? And also, are rats designed to have that much glycine administered to them, whether it be volitionally and orally, therefore, or from an external source, as was done within this study? I don't think so. So whatever the results are in the study, the next time I see a fucking rat, I'll tell them about these results. These rats developing urinary stones in 38 days. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that is one of the concerns. There's calcium oxalate kidney stones, which are the most common type. But Interesting. 
you escape this, especially with all that glycine coming through? I believe so. Yeah, actually. Exactly three weeks into the carnivore diet after a bit of a break. Two years and I wake up in severe pain. Turns out that I have a kidney stone. Three weeks, Mike. This is an anecdote of a three-week carnivore embarker. Are you kidding me? Oh my god, this is just as bad, maybe a little better, than Mike's previous claim that a carnivore diet embarker succumbed to having a stroke soon after adopting the diet, after a few months. Strokes are a form of cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease in any manifestation and presentation takes decades to develop, so it could not have been her diet. Wow. Remember, remember guys, desperate, desperation. This redditor said, I got kidney stones a few weeks into a carnivore diet. The top commenter said, that sock salate dumping for ya. It's another less liked comment admitted to seeing long-term carnivores getting kidney stones. And yes, just to fact check that, from the University of Iowa and my home. It takes several months for even small stones to form, but for people who are more likely to form stones, stone formation can happen in a matter of weeks. Congratulations. Typically though, do you see young people developing kidney stones? Even when eating a lot of meat, by the way? No. And just because a stone forms, doesn't mean that the amount of stones that are created will attain the threshold for which the body cannot actually excrete them properly and adequately. Here, yes, yeah, stone formation can happen in a matter of weeks. And if any vegans are watching and you want to say that that's desperation, go ahead, fine, whatever. Of course, we're talking about a keto diet here, generally for people on a carnivore diet, and we see a lot of kidney stones in the literature there. A lot of- Interesting. What does a ketogenic diet typically have within it? Plants? Yup. Carnivore. This is backwards logic. So you're saying that a ketogenic diet, when you're more broad, that encompasses more plants in it, has a greater presentation of kidney stones within those populations. Hmm. And that's somehow supposed to bolster your point? Good uric acid stones because the purines in meat form those oh, and uric acid is also what causes gout which is no no evidence you just use cause and effect you use the word cause there in order to promulgate a supposed cause and effect relationship between uric acid and gout and kidney stones etc etc false mike there is no evidence to support that claim rewind my video to find out why i covered uric acid already inflammatory <laughs> joint issue, you get those crystals in- So let me get this straight, uric acid, an endogenously created antioxidant, is inflammatory? Is the underpinning cause of inflammatory conditions? Do you know what uric acid even f***ing is? Here's another Redditor who actually got gout for the first time in his life just four weeks into his carnivore diet. That actually makes sense, especially once again if people do it overnight. Okay? F Break with today's sponsor, Seeds DS01 Daily. No. Myth number three electrolyte supplements are normal and all of this initially on the diet that is important perhaps depends on who you are. I didn't need them at all. You should have them on standby though. I talk about this in chapter seven of my book, the transitioning chapter. Natural. There's this whole narrative here that we are apex predators that are designed to be eating all of this meat. Well, we still are, technically, but if we were actually put in a free for all situation in the wild like we used to live in, I. I don't know about that anymore. But yes, evolutionarily speaking, we were at least apex predators. We are the top of the food chain. And if you look at an energy pyramid, what is at the top of that pyramid? Carnivores. But somehow we're omnivores. We're the only exception. We're anomalous. We're omnivores. Okay. The time, but then I have to ask, uh, do lions need to take all the electrolyte supplements that these carnivores are constantly taking? No, and they're not always constantly taking them, Mike. In many cases, I think that the electrolyte supplements are abused in terms of it just being superfluously introduced into the diet. Some people just like the taste of them, which is fair enough. There is no necessity to supplement with electrolytes once you're fully adapted to the diet and acclimated. It's an initial phase, Mike. But you wouldn't know that because you don't know a lick of the carnivore community whatsoever, actually. Actually. You think you do. You construct this vision of them in your mind, predicated upon fallacious nonsense from vegan propaganda pages. Sorry, that's not us, Mike. I don't think so. A large portion of the discussions that I see on these carnivore forums is about electrolytes, how they're probably not taking enough supplements or taking LMNT, which is a certain brand, which I'm pretty sure stands for Lion Man Needs This. <laughs> but what's up with this?
explanation for why these people need to down these electrolytes all the time just to feel normal and we'll talk because of the fact that in an initial phase of carnivore adaptation or adoption insulin will tend to be much lower the body's homeostasis within those people is to maintain electrolytes within a higher insulin environment or at least a more recurring higher insulin presentation once you're on a ketogenic diet your insulin levels are going to be low even a postprandial insulin level will tend to be much lower than it usually was for those people eating carbohydrates insulin is a hormone that retains water. With that water is the associated electrolytes like salt, sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium. So what happens is the body will then excrete those through the kidneys because insulin isn't there to retain them. Your body has to acclimate to the lower insulin. So sometimes you need to supplement with electrolytes. There's a reason I said sometimes because it's not always the case. It's not an invariable phenomenon. I was not one of these people. I did not ever have to do that. Symptoms, but here is a carnivore life coach, Kate. 500,000 subscribers on YouTube, here she is. On any version of a low carbohydrate diet, whether that be a carnivore diet or a keto diet, we need more electrolytes. This is because- Not necessarily. Initially, perhaps. But also, just to reply to Mike again, you use the analogy of the lion. Animals in the wild actually do seek out salt licks. So that actually would fit nature, but anyway. Insulin levels are low, as they are when you restrict carbohydrates. Well, there you go. There's your explanation. It doesn't mean you need more electrolytes, though. There are plenty of electrolytes found within meat, even if you go salt-free. Bella, also known on YouTube as Steak and Butter Gal and on other social media platforms, is someone that doesn't consume any salt whatsoever to speak of, and she exercises and engages in resistance training. She doesn't supplement with electrolytes. So what's your explanation for that, Mike? It's additional. In many cases, I think it is superfluous. Whatever. It's not harmful, so don't worry about it. You need excrete more sodium, and this disrupts other electrolyte levels as well. Yeah, the body is not necessarily. Your body acclimates to lower insulin. The body is so clearly designed to be consuming carbs that when you don't, your insulin level goes so low that you No, it's an acclimation, Mike. Your body's not used to it. It's not like you need to supplement with electrolytes all the time. The carnivore diet has everything you need, just like we covered in the beginning. That includes electrolytes. I don't consume electrolytes, Mike. I only very, 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 very recently, meaning as of today, I'm starting to consume a new Cerule product, Hydroactive, which is an electrolyte supplement, but it has magnesium in it. Anyway, if you're curious on learning about the Cerule products, for the link on the screen below, or what I recommend you do first, if you haven't already, look at the link in the top right corner of the screen, the Cerule products, to learn more about them. Like, add random minerals in high amounts just to not feel like you're gonna pass out? <laughs> Initially, perhaps. Usually it's not even that bad, actually. There's some cramping that occurs, maybe some palpitations. Basically, symptoms of classic dehydration, being low on water. Down below, she sells some fancy type of salt, but it interestingly doesn't appear that lions need to get sodium from any other source. They're just able to eat meat. Their body is a adapted to do- I believed that. I said that earlier and I thought that could have possibly not been true. It's typically like herbivores and some omnivores will do it. But exactly, you don't need to eat it. They get it all from meat. Same thing with humans, by the way. You know, it might be a little bit of a red flag that these carnivorous animals don't need to be taking large amounts of electrolyte supplements, but- Neither do we, actually. But initially, if you've been eating the wrong diet for your species for, I don't know, your entire life, it helps to have them on standby. Because once again, I keep saying this, let's hammer it in. Some people don't need them initially, even. Uh, yeah, anyway. And to combine things together here, ironically, as this study found, going back to kidney stones, high meat and higher sodium intake both made kidney stone resistance worse. Yeah, so what's happening if you don't- Kidney stone resistance? You mean the resistance to the excretion of them? Perhaps? But the thing is, is oxalic acid binds to minerals. For example, a good analogy to use here would be that if you're consuming only carbohydrates, your propensity to actually upregulate your Randall cycle to a deleterious degree is still quite low. But if you consume fat alongside it, you make it worse and you could cause yourself some inflammation. Does that mean the fat was the enemy? No, it means that the carbs are still the enemy. You can just reduce their toxicity depending on the context. Electrolytes more specifically, well, one of those things in the short term at least is the keto flu, perhaps other issues in the long term, but- Again, an adaptive sort of response. It is the body's attempt to recalibrate itself after removing a contraindicated toxin. I mean, let me tell you, Mike, when you drink alcohol for years and years and years and decades and decades and decades, and you quit cold turkey, what's gonna happen? You gonna be symptomatic? Yes. Is that a sign that you should continue drinking alcohol? No, it's a poison. Your body's used to it. It needs to 
to acclimate to its destitution of such a toxin. Same f***ing thing with carbs, and the same reason why we tell people within this space to prudently, sensibly, in a calculated, measured, temperate fashion, transition to a carnivore diet, not impetuously and cursorily, over the course of six to eight weeks. Each week, upping your consumption of animal meat and commensurately lowering your consumption of plant material, including carbohydrates, because where do carbohydrates come from? Plants. Some dairy, but dairy is also a contraindication in the human diet technically, as much as it's much less of one than plants. From LMNT's website, headaches, fatigue, cramps, and other symptoms of keto flu often follow when we don't get enough of these vital minerals. Well, I mean, sure, but it's not the result of you not consuming as much. The body needs to acclimate to the lower insulin response. It covered it. Sodium, and as a result, people stagger around in a low energy, cranky fuzz. The truth is, those who eat a ketogenic, paleo, or low-carb diet simply need more sodium than the general population. That's not necessarily the case. That also depends on activity levels. And still, you can get enough of it through meat. Sorry! Oh, somebody who's on a low-carb- You know, your body is much better at recycling minerals as well when your cellular redox potential or reduction oxidation potential is at an optimal level. An auspicious approach to reducing that redox potential is by consuming things like sugar. Reduction oxidation potential of a cell is basically the measure of the ability of a biological species to either acquire or lose electrons through ionization. Oxidation is the loss of electrons, reduction is the gain of electrons. So reduction oxidation potential. There you go passed out, so I just had to look it up, and yeah, the forums have quite a few cases of people just sharing their classic keto passing out stories. <laughs> it's just a rite of passage for some people. And, and almost invariably, these people were told contraindicated information from some carnivore influencer that told them to do it overnight, to transition overnight. January apparently is World Carnivore Month, according to somebody, and that's what people do. That's what people do during that month. They immediately switch over overnight. What's interesting to note, though, is that actually some people can get away with it and do. They say, I haven't felt better, but it's not a good idea. They also would have done fine if they had transitioned over the course of six to eight weeks. So there you go. Also see passing out on a carnivore diet specifically. That brings us to an- Yeah, your body is not used to the bereftness of carbs. Myth that all these weird and nasty symptoms are just, you know, they're not that big of a deal. It's, it's totally healthy. Just last week- I Oh, once again, tell that to other vegans, Mike. And then whenever they can't do veganism due to those symptoms and they find amelioration from those symptoms after transitioning from a vegan diet to at least even just back to an omnivore diet with animal products back in it, tell them that it's their fault and they didn't do it right. Subscriber asking me why she was experiencing heart palpitations since switching to carnivore. Probably electrolytes. As that her sodium intake was probably lower than it should be. Okay, initially, there you go. Another cause of these electrolyte issues can be a lack of enough protein consumption, which therefore causes too little of an insulin response to actually effectuate the processes within the body that require an anabolic state to be able to be effectuated within, one of which is electrolyte maintenance. Leaky kidney syndrome is a thing. You need to make sure that you're eating enough protein, and not only that, that you're eating enough protein in one bolus. Because, Mike, guess what lions do? They don't eat throughout the day, do they? They eat in one bolus. That can be another cause of it if it doesn't happen in initial phases, but actually happens along the way later on, which we've seen. Also, if you're eating too much copper from, I don't know, uh, liver, because again, you see a bunch of carnivore influencers saying, with all due respect to them, okay, because they're far more sensible, clearly, than all of these other ideologues, like one that we're critiquing right now, that say that you require organs or something, which you don't. Making that change, the palpitations have went away. From a carnivore diet coach, heart palpitations, pounding heart and flutters are a common side effect of the carnivore diet, but in most- Common side effect? Sure, I'd believe it. I'd like them to actually source that claim if they didn't. I don't really know because he's showing a little blurb up on the screen from the article, but- It's usually temporary and nothing to worry about. They of course say that it could be from a lack of electrolytes. <laughs> And from this carnivore- No, not necessarily a lack of it, but a lack of the maintenance of them, due to either too low of insulin from too little protein, or an acclimation phase during the initial stages of carnivore adoption. Diet article approved by Sean Baker, carnivore extraordinaire. In addition to the keto flu, you could see leg cramps, constipation. Constipation if you switch overnight, or if you eat too much protein as compared to the amount of fat you're consuming. The ratio is what matters, not the amount. The ratio of fat to protein matters. We know this. Breath. Again, heart palpitation. I, had, I, don't, I don't, okay, not sure about that one. That's... Decreased athletic performance. 
Hair loss. Yeah, initially. For actually probably about three months. If anyone out there is watching this and you're not carnivore yet, and you are engaging in any sort of physically arduous activity like resistance training or any type of exercise, you should expect at most a three-month reduction in your performance. It is just the way that it is. And if you're transitioning over the course of six to eight weeks, add six to eight weeks to that three-month number. That is true, yes. But what ends up happening is your performance after the acclimation tends to be much greater. Much greater. And our next one that we're going to get to, high LDL cholesterol, which... There's no such thing as LDL cholesterol. There's LDL, low-density lipoprotein. It's a lipoprotein carrier that carries cholesterol throughout the body because cholesterol is a lipid. And so if it didn't have a lipoprotein carrier that could actually go through the blood, it would separate from the blood and cause an embolism, Mike. And also high LDL, high according to normative levels of the population. Also, you said high LDL as if it were a measurement. LDL is not measured. It is estimated. It is based on a regression sum with an error around it. I don't know how large that error is. It could be very large, plus or minus a lot, actually, relative to the actual value. And also, once again, covered cholesterol in the beginning anyway, so. One should refer to the largest associative data set ever aggregated by the British Heart Foundation and the World Health Organization working independently from each other, wherein they measured the total cholesterol and LDL levels of people in 168 different countries. These are several hundred million data points around the world. And on the other axis, plotted the age-adjusted death rates per 100,000 persons per year versus their cholesterol level. And what they found was that the lower your total cholesterol level was, below 220 milligrams per deciliter, the higher the incidence of deaths were from all causes and from every sub cause, including heart disease, strokes, and cancer. Now, does that mean that the levels that precede 220 raise your risk of heart disease? No, it's an association. The largest associative data set ever aggregated on this topic, might I add. Just want to emphasize that. But what we can say is that the lowest incidence of deaths occur at 220 milligrams per deciliter. believe is just fine. And I Because it is, because your cholesterol levels and your lipoprotein levels are regulated by your genes and nothing else. Those genes having evolved for billions of years, Mike. Billions of years. So they clearly know what the f they're doing. Arrogant f Onto this by saying the amount of cases of just diarrhea or constipation. Okay, once again, covered this. Transitioning overnight, microbiome disruption. That's how it works. That's what happens. One should expect that if you transition overnight. You can evade it, but you'd be quite fortunate. Or if you're eating too much fat as compared to your protein. That will cause it as well. A yo-yo that I see on these forums is nuts. And they're all like, oh, I've had diarrhea for months, but you know, you know, maybe someday I'll dump enough oxalates to, like, cure my chronic diseases that you told me I have. The amount of nausea posts I see on forums is actually off the chart. Nausea from too much fat, okay. I mean, how are you eating too much fat? Are you combining it with sweetened whatever? Are you combining it with sugar or carbs or anything like that? Probably not because they're carnivore, but are you combining it with a sweetener? That can cause you to eat too much fat. Maybe your body's not used to eating fat in the first place. Are you new? You're just showing subjects. You're showing headings us to myth number four, which is that high LDL cholesterol, bad cholesterol is just- It's not bad cholesterol. There's no such thing as good or bad cholesterol. There's only cholesterol and different lipoproteins that carry cholesterol throughout the body. Those cholesterol lipoproteins are not deleterious because the body creates them on their own. There's HDL, IDL, LDL, SDLDL, VLDL. There's no such thing as bad cholesterol, Mike. Cholesterol itself isn't deleterious either fine and healthy. In general, carnivore dieters and experts are either completely dismissing the dangers of LDL or- There's no dangers. Dangers is a cause and effect word as well. It's very synonymous with hazardous. We already covered this in the beginning. Rewind my video, Mike. We don't dismiss it due to desperation or ideological tribalism. Already covered why we do that massively downplaying them. I mean, we're talking about people often- As we should, we should downplay something that isn't hazardous and has never been proven to be and is regulated on its own to 200, 300, 400, 500, even a thousand, as we'll discuss in a second. When un That's very rare. And also that is indicative of a problem, most likely. What I will say though, it's not indicative of cholesterol itself being a problem. It's indicative of something else. It is considered conventionally optimal, below 70. Even okay, so appeal to consensus and appeal to authority. Good stuff. It's 2024 and we're still doing this. Good stuff, Mike. I can keep throwing jabs at him, but given the fact that he still continues to appeal to authority and appeal to a consensus in 2024, I think he's had enough jabs already. If you catch my drift. And they're of course having to evolve the argument for this all the time. They have remnant cholesterol as an excuse, which I have a whole video on and how that is not a- That's probably not valid, honestly. Yeah, probably not.
to use. I wish I could go into all the detail here again, but it'd be another 10 minutes. And then they also have the lean mass hyper responder, like present. Yeah, Nick Norwitz brought that to fruition, sort of. I mean, that has to do sort of with this phenomenon, this very incipient phenomenon known as insulin suppression, the construct versus insulin resistance. I talked about that in my book as well. It's not really completely understood. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter though, still for the same reasons that I already laid out. Pre-study baseline results. Everyone's going, we're all immune. We're all lean mass hyper responders. I have a whole video on that. But even the researchers who did that meekly. I don't care what videos you have, Mike. I don't care about them that you're probably not a lean mass hyper responder if you think you are. I am of the belief that it might as well be. It's, it's a construct, it's a concept, it's a model. It doesn't matter. Mass hyper smoker in defense of smoking because. Yeah, that's synonymous because we totally have associations as strong as populations that smoke and the presentation within those populations of lung cancer of 11,500% when it comes to cholesterol consumption. We totally have associations like that. Shall I put on the screen the association that I just alluded to earlier? way that the research was done, but this is where I want to hit a particular- You don't know how research is done, and I'm not pretending to be an expert in that field either, but I know the rudimentary levels more than you do, clearly. As evinced and demonstrated patently in my language with regard to the science, like risk, and my very assiduous, punctilious employment of proper language that elides the words risk and hazard and dangerous, something that you, sir, continue to get incorrect. That I have- And abuse best yet, and that is the notion that, oh, well, high LDL doesn't matter as long as your inflammation is low, you know, it's like, you need- Even when your inflammation is high, LDL is not causal in heart disease, and the fact that one plus or minus one percent of atherosclerotic plaque consists of cholesterol evinces that as well. So even within the carnivore space, we like to say that, well, you know, it's an inflammatory condition, and LDL only becomes bad when it's oxidized and therefore invaginates itself into the arterial wall. One plus or minus one percent still, guys. And I want to be very clear, you may think that I'm being very sanctimonious and haughty, like I'm better than everyone else within my sphere, I'm like the king of carnivore, something that Frank Tufano did. I'm not being like that, promise. I still have respect for these people. It's just when you're on the right track dietarily and you make errors here and there, the errors mean more. To actually light the fire, well, that's bogus. First of all, we have children who have familial hypercholesterolemia who obviously don't have high inflammation. They're children, but they have genes that make it so just their LDL goes up and they have, you know, bad atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is an inflammatory condition, Mike. You can't get around this. It's characterized by hyperglycemia, as well as the oxidation of LDL and other SDLDL particles, even though that's sort of a characteristic of it due to things like hyperglycemia. Because if you didn't know, Mike, glucose is a six carbon aldehyde, an aldohexose, and aldehydes form covalent bonds with cells. That's what glycation is. It's a glucose molecule binding to a protein and making it work improperly or not work at all. It deranges the protein, launching an inflammatory response from the body because inflammation is a pre-programmed response that occurs within the body when it has perceived damage to tissues, which glucose causes because it destroys lipid rafts, tears cell membranes to pieces, binds to DNA, and causes mutations to it, and in a high enough concentration, but still relatively low, kill cells outright, and or when it perceives a potential invading pathogen. And since glucose deranges proteins, the body recognizes it as foreign, and so it launches inflammation for that reason as well. So it's a two-fold inflammatory compound, Mike. Then if you put them on LDL lowering medication, you can actually reverse medication. Yeah, you should be using that word sardonically because statins are not medications. They're absolute mitochondrial poisons. That's clearly what you're alluding to. Tacitly, you are clearly alluding to statin medications. You should look into the history of statins, Mike. It's listed in my book in chapter four. Go ahead and read that book, Mike of those plaques. But it's not just my word here. We have multiple highly credentialed experts in this field saying this. Oh yes, experts. When have the experts not failed us in the last 10 years especially, Mike? Of course, you probably wouldn't think that they failed us at all. You obsequious lick spittle about inflammation not being required. For example, Nutrition Made Simple interviewed a couple of them like- Prof Really? Gil Carvalho? Nutrition Made Simple? We're gonna listen to Gil Carvalho? Are you serious? Kosick Ray, president of the European Atherosclerosis Society, who's published- Good. Okay, so you're gonna appeal to this 
consensus. You see that word consensus in there? That paper also has at the very top right of the paper, the word opinion written there. They also said that cholesterol meets all of the causal criteria or the scientific criteria for a causal factor in atherosclerosis, except the criteria they were referring to was criteria that they made up themselves. You can't do that. I can make up my own criteria and then say that glucose fits my criteria for being causal in heart disease. Wouldn't make it so. Of course, I believe glucose is a major cause of it, but talking about within the field of human nutrition science, there's no evidence of that because there's no evidence of anything being causal at all within that field. So, goodness. Wow. 200 studies. Here he is. So if you have information, you accelerate this process. So it's an accelerant in that case, in that situation. But similarly... It's also a cause. We know exactly the mechanisms. Okay. That... If, you, if that wasn't true, so if you didn't have inflammation accelerating that process, you had zero inflammation, you'd still get atherosclerosis. False. God. No. One plus or minus one percent. One plus or minus one percent. Remember that. What happened is the particles get into the wall and your body produces- Really? One plus or minus one percent. Foam cells and cholesterol. So do they? Yeah, sort of. To a two percent degree max. Yeah, sure inflammatory response. And we also have a lipidologist out of a lipoproteins institute. That's Dr. William Cromwell, again, interviewed by Nutrition Made Simple. Here's what he says. I am not a person who says that inflammation does not matter at all. I'm a person who says inflammation is not where it starts very frequently. No, actually extremely frequently, most commonly, almost invariably. Inflammation is added as the process gathers momentum and plaques become more mature over time. Also, even if that were the case, what causes inflammation? William? Glucose, perhaps? Fructose? Galactose? Plant toxins? You know, oxalate crystals are one of the most commonly found compounds to at least initiate this process of atherosclerosis, but within the plaques themselves. <laughs> All right, so as a result, uh, people say you have to have inflammation in order for ApoB to cause a plaque. You do not. But once we have a plaque... One plus or minus one percent. More ApoB feeds the plaque, it grows. And the more inflammation, the more the plaque not only grows, but becomes unstable and leads you to more event behavior. So you heard it from him. And then more specifically, it's the case that LDL can enter the arterial wall through transcytosis. That doesn't require like a high level of chronic inflammation or anything like that. And of course that can build up. And the more LDL you have, the more likely that that's going to happen. No, nope, you use the word likely cause and effect term. Next covered that. Talks about that for a sec. But the primary purpose of LDL particles is to transport cholesterol to the liver. That's its primary purpose. No, 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 no. To tissues of the body. What are you talking about? HDL carries excess cholesterol back to the liver. By doing that, we are maintaining the normal physiology. But if it's around for long periods of time and our quantity is high, it will transcytose into areas that are not its principal. Excess cholesterol is recycled or excreted by the body in fecal matter. <laughs> it's not carried by LDL at that point. A target. And there's, of course, the excuses about the large, fluffy LDL, which I've gone into a bunch, and Cromwell. Yeah, it's associative, another commonly espoused argument within the carnivore space that doesn't have too much utility, because everything I already covered is enough to dispel and dispense with this myth that really well you know he's studying these lipid accounts for a living essentially and i just have to add that it is the case that large versus small particles are not very different in size from this study 23.5 versus 27.5 microns on average for large versus small so it's not like a grape versus a basketball it's like one orange versus a slightly smaller orange <laughs> and for the bigger picture mendelian randomization looking at genetic no okay you can't Mendelian randomization. What these people did in these studies, these scientists, is they decided to analyze a large group of people that had a presentation of a gene that typically presents or causes a presentation of higher cholesterol levels. They observed them and they found that the people with the higher, I don't know if it was cholesterol or if it was LDL, doesn't really matter. Either way, they died sooner, etc., etc. You know the commonly espoused arguments. Problem is, not one time was LDL ever measured. Not one time was LDL measured. And even then, you can't measure LDL. You can estimate it. So it was based upon a proxy to begin with. This didn't show f anything. Do you see that word there? Controlled? It wasn't controlled. I covered what you have to employ and impose onto subjects in order to actually have control. This was not controlled. Trials with that show that LDL is causal to atherosclerosis. That's the best data we have here. And no, I already showed you the best associative data set that we have with respect to this field and this argument. But you want to talk about desperate evasion and dismissal and prevarication. That's what you'll exhibit when viewing that graph. 
people have had their anecdotal cases of heart issues or cardiovascular issues on carnivore. Yep, and how long did it take? How long did it take? I reacted to this post. Dr. Terry Simpson reacted to this post. Michael Reilly, or Riley. Yeah, I remember this from last year, Mike. It takes decades to develop heart disease and atherosclerosis. Basic, fundamental, rudimentary level knowledge here. Common knowledge, or at least it should be which had pretty much all been dismissed. But thankfully, that beauty YouTuber who I did a video on before that had a stroke. Yeah, just covered that. Just covered that, Mike. Onto a plant-based diet with the help of Esselstyn, you know, to try and fight it, despite originally convincing herself that it had nothing to do with the carnivore diet. But it is wild to see how the community responds. I mean, here's a guy essentially describing the symptoms of a heart attack. He even took enough electrolytes and people are like, oh, that's from what you ate before your carnivore diet. So he described symptoms of a heart attack? Was he diagnosed with having one? Did he go to the hospital? I don't want to discount people's anecdotes perfunctorily. I don't want to do that. And I'm not doing that. But we have to analyze an anecdote. I can tell you as someone who has experienced chronic pain for years and has almost died himself, that even when you do have problems, you also start to make up some in your head sometimes, or at least you exaggerate certain pains because you are in danger already and inflate them to something that's much greater than what is actually happening. That does happen. It doesn't mean everything's in your head, like a lot of people will say, but you start to have a heightened response to things. And since we know that the majority of the demographic, if I had to guess, within the carnivore space are people that are transitioning to the carnivore diet due to being extremely sick and very unwell, that is an important variable to take into consideration. We also have this person saying, you know, whenever they add fatty meals as they're transitioning to carnivore, they get chest pain. They were recommended ox bile <laughs> as a solution. All right, now we're gonna get even more into the nitty gritty with the last myth that I've left here, and that is myth number five, that a carnivore diet doesn't give people scurvy and also- Okay, yeah, it doesn't. Do you see any carnivores dropping dead from scurvy, Mike? The only people that really get scurvy nowadays, and it's very rare still, but you can find cases of it, are people that have extreme eating disorders like anorexia, or they eat nothing but flour or something your vitamin C requirement is lower. Car it absolutely is because the cells or the transporters that actually sequester vitamin C into the cell membrane is the GLUT4 transporter. Does that sound familiar? Oh yeah, it's the same transporter that sequesters glucose. Glucose and vitamin C cross inhibit one another. They compete for transportation into the cell membrane at the same transporter. Also, sugar reduces your redox potential because of what it does to your cells and how it deranges them and destroys them. Your ability to recycle vitamins and minerals increases markedly when you have optimal redox potential. Glucose and other compounds reduce that. The amount of vitamin C that need to be present within the blood to prevent scurvy is 10 micromoles. To convert that into milligrams, that's around 1.15 milligrams. And that's just how much is needed to be maintained within the blood. Once again, if you recycle things more efficiently and proficiently, and your body's more adept at doing such a thing, you don't need to eat that much vitamin C on a daily basis. Turns out, Mike, the dietary requirement for vitamin C with in a normal physiological system that is functioning optimally with optimal redox potential, et cetera, et cetera, is in the nanograms, which are billionths of grams, Mike. Billionths. You eat sugar, you raise that requirement. But the current dietary guidelines recommend 80 milligrams. It's not like that excess vitamin C you consume is simply excreted through the urine. It is excreted through the urine, but it goes through a conversion process. Oxidized vitamin C, dehydroscorbic acid, through allosteric inhibition in excess, is converted into oxalates, then is excreted through the kidneys. And we just covered the topic of kidney stones, Mike. There's your information on vitamin C. Built differently. Yeah, you saw that vitamin C intake on the chronometer app. It is the case that there's an abysmally low amount that they like don't- It's in the nanograms that you even need it. That's the measurement in milligrams, Mike. Those are thousandths of grams. How about you look at the billionths of grams? We have enough. Count in meat, and that can vary a little bit, but it's still extremely low. So you're going to be really on the low end here and just right in the beginning after- Is it adequate? Is it sufficient? Obviously, patently, demonstrably within our population. You don't see carnivores dying of scurvy. You see anorexics dying of scurvy, or at least being diagnosed with it. That studies over and over again show that higher levels of vitamin C are associated with lower levels of mortality. So like you- Congratulations. You're talking about higher intake and also association. I'm not saying vitamin C isn't essential. Sufficient vitamin C is important. In fact, you don't want more than is required for the reasons I've already laid out about oxalates. E on the higher end. 
But I've seen many times carnivore doctors just completely denying there's no such thing as scurvy on a carnivore diet. Nobody gets it. Nobody gets it, Mike. If you cite people's anecdotes, which are people that are trying to be sensational, like Joey Schwartz, an 18-year-old boy, there is still no evidence. Show us a case report. Show us evidence that they even had scurvy. The only time I've ever heard a plausible case was when someone consumed only beef jerky. Vitamin C is a water-soluble vitamin. Beef jerky is bereft of water. There's your answer. I think it's super duper common because people are probably like cheating and other things that we're going to talk about. Wow. So desperate evasion, Mike. You want to talk about desperation. Look at that argument. Well, they just have to be cheating. They have to be cheating. What a child. What an absolute f***ing pallid, haggard, desperate child. People are cheating. Goodness me. That's why we maintain our vitamin C levels, everyone. It's because we cheat. But, you know, James Blunt, the singer, got scurvy on his carnivore diet. I don't know why they never mentioned that. Was there any evidence of that? This is a person that is famous. They're designed to be sensational. That's like their job. Histrionics. That's their job. Theatrical exaggeration and hyperbole. Sorry, I don't believe it. And here's the thing. If he did, what was his carnivorous diet constituted of? Dairy and beef jerky? I'm scurvy full. Scurvy full. It's true. But there are also some other cases. Wow, it's just like Lane Norton's edits. Really? Literature here that I have not mentioned on this channel, so let's look to this case report. We have a young person out of Dubai eating an exclusively meat-based diet. Ironically, not just being anemic, but having straight up scurvy with skeletal issues. And the next one is easily my favorite title of like any study I've read in a long time. It's scurvy in an unrepentant carnivore. <laughs> it's what kind of carnivorous diet were these people consuming? Because here's the thing, Napoleon's army survived a very long time and a very onerous, light, and arduous journey eating only horse meat and going five days without food until they found another one and they ate another horse. There have been plenty of populations that have evaded scurvy by eating exclusively meat. We're done here. I'm someone that hasn't developed scurvy. It's been well over a year, but I'm cheating. I'm cheating, everyone. Four-year-old Appalachian dude who ate essentially mostly canned beef for his diet. Wasn't looking good for him. He had like a four by two centimeter sack of dark bloody fluid drained. He was then given vitamin C pills, but you know, after running out of those and getting other health issues, he sought medical attention and admitted that his diet was still limited to canned beef. And they go as far as to say that like a diagnosis of scurvy can be made with not just symptoms, but also a diet that is devoid of fruits and vegetables <laughs> together. And while I am stretching here a little bit, it is the case that there are quite a few scurvy symptoms on these carnivore forums like this one talking about carrot. Yeah, you are reaching. It's not just reaching, it's false now. This is ridiculous. Vitamin C is important for collagen synthesis, so basically your tissues start to fall apart when you have scurvy, but it is not the first symptom. That's in the later stages of scurvy. In the preceding months, you usually have mental manifestations of disease, you have mental illness. Then your blood vessels start to become weak and, well, fall apart, which is why you see the veins look like they do, and that's why you see the bleeding gums, because collagen lines your blood vessels. But okay, so you're listing off what, three or four anecdotes here? These ones do not count, sorry. But the other ones that you listed, there are plenty of other anecdotes from people. Plenty. The overwhelming majority. That probably didn't even cover 0.01% of people. So this was an Appalachian person that ate canned beef only. There's an overwhelming majority of people, like I was saying, that have not developed scurvy. I'm one of them. You're not gonna get scurvy on a fucking carnivore diet. Stop fear-mongering. In order to aggrandize and adorn your ideology, your theological position, predicated upon nothing but poor morals, actually recommended vitamin C, which I thought was interesting in the comments. Of course, you can get vitamin C from organ meats, but that's just gonna make- Unnecessary. In another way, because it's disgusting. So what do people use to dismiss this? Well, it's your opinion, and it means nothing. It has to do with claims by Dr. Chafee, for example, this carnivore doctor who is literally afraid of plants. Like, I feel like the land- No, not literally afraid of plants. It's not fear, actually. It's not fear. Where the fuck did he say that? Action Walmart, he'll just run the other way. Like they're trying to kill him, is what I responded to before. And he says this is a transporter competition issue. Here he is. One of those is vitamin C as well. So when you're eating carbohydrates, carbohydrates uh, use a glute four transporter to get into your, your system, be utilized around your body. Within the muscle and fat cells, yes. Same transporter is used for vitamin C. When yes, correct. Absolutely, unassailably correct. Anthony Chafee of carbohydrates that drowns out the vitamin C and so you need an abundance and overabundance of vitamin C in order to absorb the little that you need and you really only need a little. So is this correct? True. No, of course you're gonna say it's not true and we'll put you right where you're wrong here. 
For some traffic jam that occurs with your glute four transporter with vitamin C here, well, just even a quick look at the biology here shows that the main form of vitamin C, ascorbic acid, is actually trans- There's sodium vitamin C transporter. Yes, SVCT, sodium vitamin C transporter. That's one of them. The other is glute transporter. Holy shit. Using a sodium transporter, uh -huh. it is the oxidized version, dehydroascorbic acid that uses GLUT4, as you can see from this diagram. Yes, and since vitamin C, ascorbic acid, is an antioxidant and is a reducing equivalent, what happens when it performs that duty? Oh, it gains electrons to form dehydroascorbic acid. So, if it needs to be utilized within the cell, then guess what it competes for absorption with? Glucose! It makes it way less likely that there's some sort of weird traffic jam going on, which was just speculation in the first place. And not exactly speculation, because we know the mechanisms. In the weeds here, but he does go on and make what I think is a bogus claim that like Vikings didn't get scurvy because they were eating so much meat and meat helps them with vitamin C. It does, absolutely. Can you explain it in any other way? You see, sailors develop scurvy. It's the most common childhood story that we've all heard. And James Lind, Dr. James Lind, discovered that citrus juice cured it because it has vitamin C in it. So, of course. They won't tell you, usually, that the reason those pirates and those sailors developed scurvy was because the only thing they were fucking eating was hardtack. What's hardtack? Oh, it's flour and water. Mm -hmm. They didn't develop scurvy in the months preceding that journey when they had, I don't know, meat? Sure, to be fair, they also had pea soup and they had beer, which... Maybe it has trace amounts, I have no idea. And uh, look at the, you know, the, the Vikings and things like that. They sailed all over the world. They sailed to, to the New World and they were not, they were- In Napoleon's army. Bringing in a bunch of lemons and limes. They, they, they had- Especially considering the fact that the size of those, if they even existed back then, I can't remember, it's either oranges or limes that are actually man-made recently. So one of those didn't even exist back then, most likely, were not the same size. They were much smaller back then. So they didn't have the fruit like we have today, so barrels full of salted meat, right? They didn't get scurvy. But yeah, from this actually published paper, there is an old Norwegian name for scurvy, skirbjur, skirbjur, which was first used in a uh, Viking saga a thousand years ago. And that- Fantastic. So they had a word for scurvy. Good. We know what sailors used to actually eat to develop scurvy. It was hardtack. Still waiting on my scurvy to arrive, Mike population actually knew about how plants could help with it, such as cabbage, which, you know... They can, because they have vitamin C in it. They're not required. That's the caveat. They're not required. Citrus juice helps stave it off as well, because it has vitamin C in it. But so does fucking meat, Mike. What historians I've read say, they just put cabbage on the ship too. And yeah, this is showing up on these Reddit forums you know, with one post about their vitamin C deficiency in blood. Okay, so again, looking at blood tests and not presentation. This person did not say anything about presentation of symptoms. We put too much merit on blood tests. I don't care about blood tests and neither should anyone else here. Despite even eating liver for vitamin C and the number one comment was that blood tests don't reflect tissue levels. That's also true. That is true, Mike. That's not desperate evasion. That just in addition to that way lower mortality risk with higher vitamin C. Not risk, cover that. Low levels of vitamin C can have other symptoms that are notable, like leading to- They can. Low as compared to what value though, Mike? Lower immune function, which uh, we've seen bad results with that with COVID on low carb diets. This can- If anything, you're citing associations that I've, I'm not even aware of those, so. After many weeks of deficient intake, but it's funny, this carnivore site was like putting the amount of vitamin C in meat up against the percent that you would need to prevent scurvy. And even though in the beginning of the article, they said that you can eat enough to prevent scurvy, they're still landing at like 15 to 25% of what you would need. Like that's, that's the goal that they- In order to prevent scurvy, you need about 1.15 milligrams in your blood, not as a daily intake. That's the caveat. We already covered the recycling phenomenon. The amount of vitamin C that is required for people to consume if they have optimal redox potential in their cells is in the nanograms. Billionths of f***ing grams, Mike. Once again, we are done. It's like one ninth as much as you need for your RDA. So in the end- RDA, 80 milligrams is RDA. We already covered that. Dangerous, actually, if anything. Some of these myths, I still feel like we're at the tip of the iceberg here. We didn't even touch on things like 
the Randall cycle and how carbs and fat like don't mix or like weird ice. What the hell are you talking about? That was a poor representation of what the Randall cycle actually is. You don't know what the Randall cycle is. If you want to learn about the Randall cycle, refer to one of the videos that it will be linked in the top right corner of the screen, whether it be the one I did on Glucose Goddess or the one that I did on Dr. John McDougall or McDougall. Still don't know how to pronounce his name probably because that sums it up. Mike, you have no idea what the f*** you're talking about. You have absolutely no clue what you're talking about and it's demonstrable and you're pallid and haggard. You don't look well, okay? No vegan does. Top analyses for why we're meant to be carnivore. Yeah, we are. That was what we evolved to eat, which means that our genes evolved for it. I will cover antagonistic pleiotropy some other time. Haven't covered that on the channel yet. That's something that Matthew Nagra talks about. And touch on how something's ability to you know, get rid of diabetes temporarily doesn't mean that it's healthy or really truly healing you in the long run. I mean, for example, Danielle Bellardo, cardiologist's uh, patient going on a Coke binge who had diabetes and no longer having it when they came back just from lower calorie intake. Anyway, so I- Not calorie intake because you can't consume calories because they're photons of light and can't be brought to rest. They have a rest mass of zero. So anyway, yeah, it's very similar to the argument that a vegan diet can ameliorate your diabetes, but it isn't healthy. Exactly. But the carnivore diet is the species appropriate, species specific diet for our species as inferred from judicious inferences from comparative anatomy, paleoanthropology, inferential paleoanthropology, and then chemical anthropology, which is a causal science. So it's very hard science. Biochemistry, other areas of human physiology, regular chemistry, a lot of times physics when talking about calories, we're done. And also evolution, a hard science. We're done, Mike. Give it up. But you won't because you are a religious zealot. That is what these vegans are. They are religious. Treat them as any other religious believer and subscriber. That is exactly how you should treat these people because that is exactly what they are. It is not predicated upon health. It's predicated upon a moral doctrine. The animals' lives are more valuable than human lives. Do a part two, but it's pretty clear that uh, there is a risk of not getting enough nutrients on a carnivore diet. According to the RDAs and RDIs covered that though. We covered it. So ironic because they're constantly like poo-pooing vegans for a lot of these nutrients that we're actually doing amazingly well on from the recent studies. According to RDAs and also that completely neglects to mention the bioavailability. It completely neglects to mention all the nutrients that you're missing out on and it completely neglects to mention the amount of supplements you have to take to maintain those levels. We're done. 12 having a better status than meat eaters in some cases. And also, yes, what they said earlier that you tried to denigrate and disparage, the argument that blood levels do not represent tissue levels is extremely accurate. If there's a bunch of a vitamin in your blood, but your body can't use it, it'll show up adequately and sufficiently on a blood test. It will not show up adequately and sufficiently in your tissues. Pretty self-explanatory, Mike. You didn't actually have any counter argument for that. And of course, whether we're talking about oxalates and oxalate dumping and causing disease as well as, you know, electrolytes just being normal, natural, and necessary, and just random horrible symptoms all the time. Like, yeah, I think you're getting the idea that these carnivore diet people, you know, might not be getting the best information, which again is on projection and also a little snarky jab there from a d head because they're just trying to be healthy and a lot of these negative effects like with LDL can- Not effects, because LDL doesn't cause any negative effects, Mike. We're done. A long time to develop or they can really hurt people really fast, which is sad. So anyway, on that note- Okay, and you completely neglect to mention all the people that it has saved because it doesn't fit your ideology, Mike. Palette Haggard Mike, here to tell us all about health and what's indicated. Like to try seeds ds01 daily no we wouldn't want to do that anyway okay we're done we're done with your video mike uh that was insufferable Sixteen thousand views 1.7k likes 400,000 subscribers. Anyway, just ridiculous. I pretty much said everything that we need to say here, though. I don't like reacting to Mike the Vegan. Not a fan, but anyway, if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, please subscribe to the channel, and please leave your thoughts in the comment section below. And if you're looking to ameliorate any inflammation or you need an extra punch or an extra kick to ameliorate some excellent inflammation that may still be present on a carnivorous diet bereft of plant material or carbohydrates to speak of, really, I would suggest referring to the link on the screen below. And first and foremost, learning about the products from the video that I alluded to earlier, the Cerule products that'll be linked in the description. Also email me at edgoki14 at gmail.com if you have any questions or if you'd like to email me and ask me how to get those products for free. And with that being said, join me next time when we react to someone else that is arrogant and also clueless with respect to any aspect of human nutrition science really and any other sciences. So see you then.